This is episode 12 with Caitlin McCall. Welcome to the Eco Conscious Diver Show. I'm your host, Caitlin, Patty Scuba instructor, scientific diver, and science communication specialist. I'm here to remind you that being eco conscious is cool. Learning about the environment can be fun, and climate change isn't a dirty phrase. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe as your weekly dose of motivation so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready to dive? What's up, everybody? If you're listening to this right now, this is an opportunity to join in with the Eco-Conscious Diver community and use our passion to create a more sustainable blue planet. Eco-Conscious Diver is a lifestyle brand and podcast, illuminating our path to eco-conscious diving, overall sustainability, and a healthy planet for future generations. Head over to the website, www.eco-consciousdiver.com for all other podcast episodes, other resources, and the Eco Dive Shop. This episode is packed with insight into sustainable aquaculture and a company with a mission to save the ocean. I hope you'll enjoy this podcast with Nicholas Quintaros, founder of 25 Degrees. Hi, Nicholas. How you doing? Hi, Caitlin. How are you? I'm good. It's it's, uh, great to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we'll jump straight into the introductory question, which is what is your favorite marine species and why? So my favorite marine species is a fish called cobia. Um, And it's for personal reasons. I actually uh, studied aquaculture at Rasmus at UM. Uh, I was then shipped off to Panama where I raised cobia larvae um, for about a year. And those cobia larvae then get put in a nursery system and eventually into open ocean cages um and it, uh, at open blue it's actually one of the largest offshore fish farms on the planet and they're trying to develop uh the, the the most sustainable way for us to to farm the ocean um so yeah definitely cobia that's so cool and i know that we could probably go into open ocean fish farms and talk about that for an hour so definitely <laughs> Not That's to get, its own topic. <laughs> yeah, not to get too far into that, um, but could you tell our listeners just exactly why that's sustainable? So the idea behind farming the open ocean as, or when comparing it to inland farming or closer to shore, is that in the open ocean you have uh, really high currents, and usually the water it never gets the water doesn't go through the cage twice. So. Essentially, you're diluting the environmental impacts of the farm over a larger surface area or a larger area. And that way, uh, you can minimize your environmental impacts uh, of farming and get an extremely high yield as well so that we can feed the ocean or so we can feed the world sustainably. Because uh, many, many of us know that fish or overfishing is a huge problem. So fisheries have hit their maximum output, uh, Mm -hmm. per se, and we need to come up with ways to meet the demand for seafood in a sustainable manner. Um, Offshore fish farming is not where it needs to be uh, for us to feed the world sustainably, but we are definitely well on our way. Um, And there are multiple projects, whether it's in Hawaii, uh, Vietnam, Panama, they're all over the world trying to really figure out a way to do this both profitably and sustainably, which are both essential for us as a species to feed ourselves. Because if it's not profitable, it's not sustainable. And that's something my professor really uh, instilled in me. And we need to make money uh, to be able to move the industry forward. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I actually, um, caught wind of a little rumor that there might be an offshore, um, place near Tampa that would be opening. Did you hear about that? So I can, I'm not sure how in depth I can go into this, but there is uh, a project that is supposed to go in, uh, I believe West of Sarasota. Uh, 
So they are developing the offshore aquaculture techniques uh, and trying to develop that industry in the U.S. as we are one of the countries that have the most coastline in the world. Um, and there are definitely opportunities for us here to expand upon what people have done elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's divers listening in Florida, if you're, if you're on the West coast, you can look out for some cool jobs there for sure. Um, all right. So to introduce your project, um, you are restoring the tropical seas with 25 degrees. Um, it's a company which donates a portion of each sale in order to plant 25 mangroves for each product sold. So tell me a little bit about um, your background and how you got this started. What was your, your motivation? So I actually grew up between Miami and the Florida Keys. Um, and my parents, I was lucky enough that my parents had a house down there. And I saw the degradation of the reef as I got older. Um, so I went to Florida State. I actually was pre-med to begin with, um, but somehow found my way to aquaculture or, and biology. Um, after starting open blue, I had a schedule where I needed to fill my time. So I, I figured out a business where I can make the most impact, uh, while also being able to work a full-time job on the side. Uh, so 25 degrees is really the, the, the baby that comes from that. Uh, and so we actually have pivoted our marketing or our, our mission just slightly. Um, so we still are donating to mangrove restoration, uh, at the Eden reforestation project, but we're also, we also partnered with two more nonprofits, uh, the coral restoration foundation and the brief free oceans to try and come at the problem from three different sides. So trying to fight plastic, restoring corals and restoring uh, mangrove habitat and we're trying to focus all of our efforts in the Caribbean so that if and when we do get large enough to really make an impact we can really see the impact um, in a specific area. That's awesome it's, it's really important you know to go at it from several sides I think I like that you expanded your mission like that that's really cool. Definitely. Yeah. And so um, you right now have um, two products. You've got the straw hat and the trucker hat. Yes. So, yeah, we have right now we have two products. Uh, the straw hat comes in one color. The, the trucker hat comes in three different colors, blue, black and green. Uh, we hope to be adding stickers and shirts and different other different products so that we can expand our market and expand our audience. Um, and that'll only help the ocean in the end. Like our, our truly our goal is to plant as many mangroves, corals, and get as much plastic out of the ocean as possible. Um, I'm actually currently doing my MBA at mm -hmm. the same time as doing 25 degrees. So I've been able to integrate what I've been learning in school uh, into the 25 degrees business plan and try and do that in real time to get as big as we can as fast as we can uh, and that way we can donate as much as we can so yeah. and your, your master's is in marine ecosystems right so yeah my ma my official title of my master's is actually marine ecosystems and society uh with a focus in aquaculture um, oh, wow. and then i yeah and then i now am doing a second master's at oklahoma state university uh, pursuing my MBA in entrepreneurship. So, wow. So is that one remote? You're still yeah, that one's remote. So I'm, I'm able to work here in Miami, uh, and really don't have to plan my schedule around my school. That's really why I chose that program. Yeah, that's awesome. And you get to see, you know, the direct impacts of what's happening with your business too, being in South Florida. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So um, I think a lot of people don't know that much about mangroves and especially about the sequestering of carbon that goes on. And I think that's really interesting. So I wonder um, <clears throat> if you could explain that for us. Yeah, definitely. So there's actually been a few of these studies in, in recent years um, about how mangroves are actually some of the most some of the most efficient plants at sequestering carbon. 
and that comes from their root system. They call, have what's called aerial prop roots, or most of them do. Uh, in this case, I'm talking about red mangroves. Um, and these mangroves collect soot and all these different types of debris that will then decay under their roots and, and they, it basically gets trapped in their root system. And that carbon then gets stored in the sand under the mangroves for generations and generations and generations. And that's why it's so bad when we do cut down a mangrove forest, um, we're releasing all this carbon into the atmosphere that otherwise was sequestered uh, basically indefinitely until that forest uh, would change habitat. Uh, so mangroves are actually better than ra uh, tropical rainforests at sequestering mangroves um, and amongst the best plants overall to sequester carbon. So they really are one of the keys to fly fighting climate change is to both protect and restore our mangrove habitats here in the Caribbean and around the world. Yeah. And, you know, I always like to bring it back to um, why, why humans should care. Um, just because I feel like, you know, of course, we hope that everyone cares about the environment as much as we do, and that's enough. Um, but for some people, bringing it back to them really helps. Um, and so mangroves actually do protect humans from hurricanes. Yes, they do. Right. So, yeah, man mangroves do a lot. So mangroves, one of the most direct ways that people can see how mangroves affect us are hurricanes. And you, you see, if you go into a mangrove habitat after a hurricane, like I did last year or two years ago now, um, after Irma, you can see that the front row of mangroves is dead, right? So they, they took all of that wave energy and all that wave action and took the brunt of it so that we wouldn't have to, our homes wouldn't have to, and the coastline wouldn't have to. And that mm -hmm. allows the mangrove habitat to then grow out and really avoid the extreme erosion that you see in other areas around Florida when, um, when a hurricane comes through. So that's the most direct way. Um, but I think the biggest way that they affect us as humans and just us, it's really an economic argument is the best argument for protecting mangroves and it's not carbon it's really a mathematical equation of when there's more mangroves especially mangroves along the coastline in an area there's more fish in that area and then therefore we profit more off of the ocean uh, whether it be diving fishing uh, snorkeling any type of tourist activity uh, the more mangroves there are, the more life there is in, in any given ecosystem. Uh, so there really is an economic impact to mangroves that people don't really realize how important they are for our um, ocean economy. Yeah, so I guess it kind of goes hand in hand, you know, like people say, you know, sharks and coral reefs um, are worth more alive than they are dead. And it's the same with mangroves, right? Definitely, definitely, definitely. And it all kind of ties together. I like that you mentioned the sharks and the coral reefs. Um, that so mangroves and coral reef, mangroves actually act as coral nurseries as well, um, allowing the coral, the, especially the really early on, the early on in when they're almost a single polyp, uh, they're able to grow in the mangrove roots and then go out from there. Uh, and they also act as nursery habitats for juvenile sharks um, in many, many parts of the world. So they're all three of them are really connected, uh, really interconnected. And, and you just see that all over marine ecosystems is, yes, there's one or two or three species that are really, really important, but it all connects together in the circle of life, I guess is the best <laughs> way to call it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know, okay, so you, you do work with Coral Restoration Foundation. I feel like I talk about that so much just because <laughs> um, I worked with them while I lived in the Keys. But I want to um, talk about, um, it was debris-free oceans. Yes. What exactly um, do they do? It's a, it's a bunch of beach cleanups. Yeah, so debris-free oceans, uh, the founder is actually another graduate of Rasmus. So that's how we got connected with debris-free oceans. And they do a lot of beach cleanups, like you had mentioned. Uh, and they also recommend different types of sustainable products what, uh, to the private industry. 
uh, whether it be food, uh, food sales or um, even in my mom's dermatologist office, uh, we were able to use their website to get uh, some recommendations on some sustainable products that we can use to replace single-use plastic in the workplace. Um, so they're a very good resource for that, and they help the they help private businesses move from single-use plastics to a more sustainable uh, way of doing business. Uh, so trying to remove all single-use plastics from the workplace. That's super cool. And I bet especially, like, I immediately just think about restaurants. Yeah, you know? definitely. <laughs> restaurants is definitely the first thing that comes to mind, but uh, people don't realize that, like, in a corporate setting when just your coffee just – you have one station that's a coffee station, but if there's a hundred people using that coffee station a day, you're producing a lot of plastic waste that you could otherwise uh, get rid of or eliminate using other biodegradable alternatives. So. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, so I know you have an ambassador program. So tell me a little bit about that. So we're trying to develop our ambassador program right now. Uh, it's, and we're reaching out to different college kids mostly and trying to develop our presence on university campuses. Um, and we have a point system so that they get um, compensated accordingly. So for like, for example, every email that they get to sign up, that's three points and uh, every hat that they sell is 10 points. And it's a, it's a point system so that we are able to compensate them um, and they can spread our message throughout college campuses around the U.S. That's awesome. I have to say, like, I do really like the trucker hats, but I love the straw hat. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to wear it all the time. Like, it's perfect for awesome. like, kayaking, the beach, because my, my cheeks always get burnt. So yeah. It's going to be like no. my summer best friend. <laughs> I, w I was using those trucker hats before I, I started this company. Same, same type of style, and it's because my mom is a dermatologist, so they're really good at at protecting your full face and neck and your shoulders. And, and that way you don't have to use as much sunscreen because I know a lot of people uh, don't like putting sunscreen on their face. I'm me included. Um, so they're definitely a good substitute for that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, that is the thing, right? Like we want to reduce the amount of sunscreen that we use. And when we do use sunscreen, we want to use reef safe sunscreen. Definitely. Like room to see. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, and you also do wholesale and partnerships. Um, who, who have you done partnerships with or what type of partnerships have you done? So again, we are a young company, so we're developing this right now. So we are, uh, we have wholesale partners with a dermatology office in Miami, uh, for the straw hats only right now. Uh, and then we're reaching out to different, uh, dive shops, tackle shops, gift shops in Miami and the keys and trying to really develop uh, our wholesale uh, partnerships locally uh, before we branch out into anything bigger. So that's so cool. I feel like I see like a ton of those types of hats, you know, in like Definitely. West Marine. You need to get in West Marine. That yeah. would be <laughs> I hope if anyone is a buyer for West Marine, we are open to, uh, if you're listening to becoming this. a partner. <laughs> Definitely. Cool. Um, so you don't do this full time. Um, tell me about what your full time gig is. So I'm actually uh, working as a consultant right now uh, for a company called Aqua Soul uh, in Miami. Uh, and we are starting a new project called Project Matchmaker, uh, where we are connecting accredited investors to aquaculture businesses and startups that need the capital. Uh, and we think that there's a really big opportunity for us there, uh, being that it, their COVID-19 has really put a wrench in a lot of businesses plans, uh, for 2020, uh, and a lot of businesses are in need of capital. So that we are hopefully going to be the bridge between, uh, outside investment and the aquaculture industry as we try to kind of supercharge it with more investment. Uh, specifically, in the, we're trying to focus on the U.S. Uh, as much as we can uh, because we believe that that's going to be a, a big growth market um, as we move forward. 
And what is, what do you think is the uh, most common fish in aquaculture in the U.S.? In the U.S., it has to be either tilapia or catfish. Uh, that would be my, my two that are the most common. Uh, then you have your salmon and your shrimp. And then there's kind of everything else. So it's those big four. And then everything else is uh, more of a niche type thing. That's interesting. I actually went to, um, and I'm sure you've spent a ton of time here, the um, University of Miami aquaculture area. We took yeah. like a trip there <laughs> Definitely. Um, when I was at Florida Keys College. And I think they were saying that um, cobia is like their main fish that they're doing, right? Yeah. So actually the fish, the cobia that you see at UM uh, are actually open blues fish. Uh, and that's because open blue is the, uh, their they have a research contract with UM. So UM holds what's called their brood stock or their breeders, the fish that breed in tanks, and then they take those eggs and send them to Panama whenever uh, they need eggs at the farm. So while I was in Panama, uh, we got many, many shipments from UM to be able to, to stock our tanks uh, on a timely basis. How do you ship eggs like that such a far, long way without them like going bad? How so do they? There's a few things you do, but just to make a long story short, basically you uh, take the eggs out of the egg collector in the morning. Uh, you put them in vac or vac or airtight bags uh, that have oxygen or water that's been super saturated with oxygen. Um, and then you put buffers in the water so that the pH doesn't uh, come up with uh, excess CO2. Um, and then you are really, really careful when you receive them on the other end, uh, bringing them uh, back to, sorry, I forgot really one super important um, point is that you have to put them in really, really cold water. So, you, so their metabolism drops and you ship them and it takes about, a day to get their full 24 hours in the box. Um, and when we received them in Panama, we bring the temperature up really, 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 really slow. Um, and then they go into our tanks over there. It's a lot like shipping a goldfish. Uh, very, very similar to that. So interesting. It's crazy all the things that go into all of this. <laughs> it's very scientific. It's cool. Um, so all like it seems like all of the things that you do are pretty connected. It's definitely, <laughs> definitely. that that's kind of um, the whole idea for twenty five degrees kind of came from working with larvae uh, and mangroves being, I guess, the larval rooms of the sea, and just the two kind of connected, and I was able to to start this company and try and do as much good as possible for the Caribbean um, while we still can. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, seriously. And so, um, of course, I have to ask this question. Are you a scuba diver? <laughs> I am a scuba diver, not an experienced scuba diver. I uh, prefer free diving, but I did scuba dive in the Galapagos, and that was an incredible, incredible experience. Um, we were on the side of an underground volcano or an underwater volcano and just doing a drift dive uh, while the mantas are overhead and the, the schools of hammerheads everywhere and all different types of fish you've never seen before. There's turtles swimming in and out of the group for the entire time that the, we're diving. It was pretty oh insane. God. One of the groups saw a 35 foot um, whale shark and at that same site. So it was, it was pretty incredible, but no, I'm not an experienced diver, but the few dives I have done have been extraordinary. So that was like, so you've only been diving there. Uh, that was my third, fourth and fifth dive. I believe when I was in the wow. Galapagos. You're yeah. so spoiled now. Anytime yeah. <laughs> Definitely. It's going to be hard for you to go other places. That's so cool. I've heard that the Galapagos are kind of like, you know, um, Jurassic Park or something. It's like that's, kind of taking a step back. That's in a good way to, to describe it is like you see things there and uh, that you just don't see 
other places. Like it, we saw at one point, it was probably three or 4,000 birds all dive at the same time. Uh, and it looked like one big arrow coming out of the, the sky. And they're all diving at this same ball of bait that's getting pushed up by all the sharks and dolphins underneath. And it's just, it, it, it's an incredible place. It really that's, is. That's amazing. And have you um, dove with Coral Restoration Foundation yet? I have not dove with, uh, dove with them yet. Uh, I eventually plan on doing so. Uh, but we got to put the work in on land so that we can uh, plant some corals in the sea. It's so true. So if, um, if the listeners want to help you with your project, what is the best way for them to help you? So uh, the best way for them to help us is to buy one of our hats. Uh, if they don't want to buy one of our hats, to donate to one of our uh, nonprofit partners and uh, support their cause because their causes are uh, worth supporting. Uh, and if not, follow us at 25 degrees, the word 20, the number five, the word degrees uh, on Instagram or on Facebook. Uh, and just follow our story and see if there's any products that you would want to buy as we add more and more to our collection. Yeah, and your social media is really great because you actually um, give a lot of cool scientific information, you know, that I feel like people can follow along and learn from. I love that when brands do that. Definitely. We're trying to be. So well, we're trying to establish ourselves as like, an authority on uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, and at the end of the day, if we don't know the benefits of what we're doing, then how can we communicate it to any of our customers? So, yeah, absolutely. That's the, the link right there is like, you've, you've got to teach people about it in order for them to, you know, be passionate and for sure. Well, do you have anything that you want to hint at that's upcoming that you want to tell the listeners about? We kind of covered everything. <laughs> um, I guess next week we will be doing a post. Um, I'm not really sure if this is even relevant, but uh, we'll be doing a post that for every share, for every new follower that we get, we'll donate 10 cents to uh, Debris Free Oceans. Um, uh, and we're trying to raise as much money as possible for uh, fighting plastic in the Caribbean. So So if they like or share it? If they share it or they follow us, we'll, we'll donate the money. That's awesome. So that brings me to a point that I've been trying to bring up throughout um, the pandemic time is just that um, this is the perfect opportunity for people that don't have money to maybe purchase a hat right now. That's how they can help you um, without spending money. Uh, Definitely. Is sharing your, your message. Definitely. And we're going to try and do one of those every month to support each of our three nonprofits and continue to get them donations that they can use to support the different causes. Awesome. And I saw you guys um, also do giveaways. Yes. So uh, if you do see one of our giveaways, share it, comment, uh, follow the instructions and, and Hopefully you can help us grow so that we can help the ocean. Uh, uh, so we can help the ocean survive. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, um, I'm so excited to see what you come up with next. You, you just keep coming out with awesome things. It sounds like you're doing cool things all around. I mean, in your job with this company, um, I'm excited to follow along and I look forward to speaking with you again about the new stuff that happens um, so that is a wrap and thank you so much. No, thank you. All right. Thanks for tuning in guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast and learned some valuable information about the journey of conservation. This is a constant process of learning, growth, and understanding. So I look forward to chatting with Nicholas again. Please leave a review if you can and go to www eco-consciousdiver.com to check out all other podcasts, resources, and everything we've got going on there. See you next week.